Hey, um, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 4 says this. The word of the Lord came to me saying, this is Jeremiah talking. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. But Jeremiah responds to God and says, alas, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Man, will you just interact with your, with your um, family member this morning and tell them the topic of today's teaching? Um, shake their hand and tell them, allow me to reintroduce myself. Amen. Allow me. Yeah. Tara, we're praying for you. Tara, we're praying for you. We love you. Allow me to reintroduce myself. Church, as we start this series of sermons, I, I want to posit, <clears throat> present, propose a precept that's really foundational to everything I'm going to talk about over the course of these next several weeks. And this, this precept I'm referring to can be captured in the following phrase. I want all my note takers to pay attention here. The phrase is as follows. God is the God of intentionality. God is the God of intentionality. Somebody say, he's intentional. <sighs> Come on, say it one more time like you mean it. Say, he's intentional. he's intentional. Yeah, he doesn't act randomly or haphazardly or coincidentally. Right. He's methodical. He's strategic. He is intentional. This means simply that his actions are never an end unto themselves. They are always a means to an end. Whenever God does anything, he's up to something. And because he's intentional, whenever he does nothing, he does nothing intentionally. So he's up to something when he's doing nothing. So when he answers your prayer, he's up to something. When he doesn't answer it, he's up to something. When he opens the door, he's up to something. When he closes the door, he's up to something. When the answer is yes, he's up to something. When the answer is no, he's up to something. When you gain, he's up to something. And when you lose, he's up to something. When people walk into your life, he's up to something. And when people walk out of your life, He's up to something. He's intentional. He does everything with purpose, for purpose, and on purpose. Come on, church. God does everything with purpose, for purpose, and on purpose. This truth needs to be more than a truth that arrests our hearts. This truth needs to be a truth truth that affects our eyes and becomes the lens through which we see all the activity of God in scripture. So when we look at God's dealings with humanity throughout the Old and the New Testament, we need to see his dealings as intentional actions from an eternal God. And this is important because I made an observation in scripture. And that observation is this. God seems to be borderline obsessed with ensuring that you and I live with an accurate understanding of our identity. Did you hear me? He seems to be consumed with constantly communicating to you and me who we are. It's interesting because if he knows everything and forgets nothing, 
Why does he have, have to keep repeating himself? He must be repeating himself not because he needs to say it. Maybe he keeps repeating himself because we need to hear it. Th that you and I need to constantly and consistently hear his perspective on who we are. Because whether you know it or not, everybody has an opinion about who you are. And most people's opinions are based on inadequate experience. In, did you hear me? Inadequate experience with you and partial information about you. But not only do people have an opinion of you, you have an opinion of yourself. There are some things that you think about you. And God, I believe, constantly and consistently communicates his view and his vantage point because of a truth that was captured by a spiritual sage named Solomon in Proverbs 23, 7, when Solomon says this. Solomon says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So now I see God's intention behind his activity of constantly communicating to me who I am because Solomon captures in this powerful proverb this truth that I'm going to live like who I think I am. Y'all not catching this. I said Solomon says as a man thinks in his heart so is he. Notice Solomon didn't say as a man thinks in his head. Notice Solomon didn't say as a man speaks out of his mouth. But as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Whatever one thinks about themselves in their heart becomes the catalyst for their act. Activity. And you really can't change someone's activity until you adjust their understanding of their identity. Do you know who you are? Because you can change my behavior for a season. But if you have not adjusted my understanding of my identity, I will always fall back into the same redundant, repetitive, dysfunctional cycles because I hadn't changed who I am. If I am a dog, at some point I'm going to bark. But if you shift my understanding of who who I am then my life will ultimately follow as a man thinks in his heart so is he so I see why God constantly and consistently begins communi communicates to his people that they are special that they are significant that they are loved that they are head and not the tail that they are above only and not beneath that that they are lenders and not borrowers that they are the apple of his eye that 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 that, that they are the pride of his heart that they are the object of his affection and the focus of his attention that that they are salt that they are light that they are chosen, that they are royal, that they are holy, that they are peculiar. I, I, I see why he constantly does that because God sees something that we may not see. You see, because if you don't sit where he sits, you can't see what he sees because where you sit determines what you see. OK, and, and so he sees some things that we don't see because he sits in a place that, that we don't sit. And God sees us from one vantage point and we see ourselves from another did you hear me I, I said God sees us from one vantage point and we see ourselves from another this is what I've learned what, I, what I've learned very often is people initially and instinctively almost resist this teaching as if it isn't relevant to them because they assume that if I'm not thinking low I'm still thinking right See, just because you're not thinking low of yourself still doesn't mean you're thinking right. 
Right? Did you hear what I'm saying? Just because you're not thinking low about yourself still doesn't mean you're thinking right about yourself because you cannot be thinking low but still not be thinking what God thinks about you. Because there's a gap between very often what the believer feels about themselves and what God thinks about them. And very often that gap, a minute, remember now, activity is the expression of one's understanding of their identity. So if I want to know what people think about themselves, i got to constantly look at their activity. So, so we can look at a believer's prayer. I can look at my own prayer life in the past. And my prayer life was a revelation of how I saw myself. Because I called myself a son of God, but I prayed like a beggar. Let me go to this side. Please, God, please feed me. Please, please, please protect my children. Please let me get home safe. Please, like he doesn't want me to get home safe. What father does not want their children to get home safe? Y'all not talking to me. That, that's a revelation of a gap between the way I feel about me and the way God feels about myself. I, 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 I could tell you, I could tell you I was forgiven. I thought I was forgiven. But my activity in terms of my reticence and my trepidation and my hesitancy when it came to prayer was a revelation that I didn't see myself as forgiven. Because you can say you're forgiven and live like and feel like you're not. Because the writer of Hebrews says, come boldly. Y'all aren't talking to me. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. But if you don't understand the sufficiency of the cross and come on now that the cross was sufficient. That as the writer of John says, it was the propitiation, it was the uh, appeasement, it was the payment for my sin. That God is fully and completely satisfied with the adequacy of Jesus' sacrifice. When he sees the blood, he sees paid in full. When he sees the cross, he sees enough that there is nothing else that is needed to satisfy his wrath toward humanity. It has been fully, unequivocally, undeniably satisfied in Jesus. Once you get that that you go boldly to the throne you just carry the right name with you you go in Jesus name because you understand your identity that I am in him that, that, that he is in me but I am also in him that I'm hid in him y'all missed it that, that I am in that he is in me but I am also in him you see right now I've got some paper right I got paper I got paper but then when I put the paper in the Bible I'm carrying the paper all around the stage, but you don't see the paper. You see what is in. Y'all missed it. And Christ is in me and I am in him. So when I go before the throne of grace, God doesn't just see me. He sees what I'm in. Y'all missing it. And he answers the prayer, not just because of who I am, but because of who I'm in. When I go in his name. Right? But there's a gap. We can say we're the apple of his eye. But we're still infected with worry. Because there's a gap. See, every biblical commandment is predicated on your every biblical commandment is predicated on you accurately understanding you see Matthew 6 saying don't worry about what you shall eat sleep drink that doesn't make sense if you don't understand you it's impossible it's not possible until your perception of you changes y'all aren't talking to me because we think I need bigger faith not to worry when the Bible teaches, mustard seed faith moves mountains. So could it be the problem is not faith? Could it be the problem is perception? Could it be that you call yourself a son, a daughter of God, but in actuality, you act like you're just a creature of a creator? How many have children? Let me see your hand. Now, how many of your children have to worry about what they're going to eat? How many of your children have to worry about what they're going to wear? 
How many of your children need to worry about if there's a roof over their head? Because you got that. So if they're worrying about that, they're worrying about that unnecessarily. They really should go to sleep. Because you can't do nothing about the mortgage. You don't have the capacity to handle the mortgage. You may as well go to, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And God is looking at you like you look at your child saying you just don't know. There's this gap. This gap. We can read, you are a royal priesthood. We can read it, right? We can read it, except the priesthood part, reject the royalty. We can accept that, but reject the royalty. And so because we don't have the revelation of royalty, we don't raise royalty. So we don't create a culture and a climate in our homes where our sons and daughters have an understanding of their identity that is so solid, so rooted and grounded in scripture that our daughters don't start exchanging their virtue for attention. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they don't exchange the virtue for attention. Virtue for acceptance. A gap. Because nobody settles that doesn't believe they have to. To settle knowing that you don't have to is illogical. But the fact that so many of us do is a revelation that there's a gap between what God thinks about me and what I think about myself. So he keeps speaking it and speaking it and speaking it and speaking it. So your opinion can move from one side and slide over to his side so that I can start thinking about me, what God thinks about me, so I can act like what God thinks about me and not what I think about myself. Did you hear what I said? I said that, that I got to keep hearing what God thinks about me so that I can act like what God thinks about me, not what I think about myself. There's a gap. Identity. Because activity flows out of identity. Ooh, it's all, it's all in the Bible. <laughs> it's all in the Bible. It's in the garden. Eve, eat the fruit and you'll be like God's. But Eve, in Genesis 126, you are already made in his image and likeness. But when I don't know who I am, I'll, I'll engage in activity to become something I already am. So I'll do stuff to feel loved when I already am. I just don't know it. I just hadn't received God's love. So I'm reaching, I'll do things to get love when I don't know I'm already am. I'll do things to get value when I don't know I'm already value. I'll do things to feel significant when I don't know I'm already significant. Am I making sense? When I think I'm supposed to live below the line and have lack and not be able to care for my family and care for my loved ones and get prescriptions filled when I'm sick and have enough in the bank so that I can cover myself when there's an emergency. If I don't believe that, I won't manage my resources that way. If I don't believe I'm going to live long, why save for the future? See, we've been engaging in practices, when I say we, I mean in culture, we've been engaging in practices that are supposedly intended to transform people's behavior while ignoring the biblical, the biblical blueprint for life change. It doesn't start with behavior. It starts with the heart. So when I kick the habit 
when I change the behavior, I, it only lasts periodically. It is short-lived because at some point, I'm going to behave out of my instinct. And if that instinct doesn't change, when my willpower, weigh, weigh, when my willpower wears down, the old me shows back up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Pastor, where are you getting this from? I'm getting it from Jeremiah. What? Yes, I'm getting it from Jeremiah. We read, we read in Jeremiah 1, we read a very critical conversation. We, 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 the, the text captures a part of a dialogue about destiny. This is no ordinary conversation. God is talking to Jeremiah about who he was born to be. He, he's talking, he's talking, this is so powerful. He's talking to a man that he wants to step into prophetic ministry, to be a spokesman, a mouthpiece for God. He, 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 wants, he wants him to be the finger on the fivefold hand, right? Because the apostle is the thumb, because it covers all the rest of the fingers. The 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 prophet is the is the, the the index finger because it points you in the right direction. The middle finger is the evangelist because it has the longest reach, and the ring finger is the pastor because he's married and comes in a covenant with the sheep. And the pinky finger is the teacher because that's the only one that can get in your ear. And so and so the the the, the prophet God wants him to be a prophet. But I'm tripping because how do you want me to be a prophet now, but you start talking to me about when I was born? Notice the text. First word in the text is so significant. He says, before I form you in the womb. Not when I form you, but before. I form you in the womb, I knew you. Not when you were in the womb, before you got there. When your mother and daddy start winking, I saw you. Y'all not talking to me. Let me go old school because I feel the love on this side right here. When they turned on the Teddy P and the Luther V. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw you. I saw you. They may not have planned you, but I saw you. You may have been an accident in their eyes, but I'm intentional. I saw you. Even if the circumstances that produced your birth were sinful circumstances, I take what the enemy meant for evil and I put my hand on it and I redeem it and I work it for good. I saw you. I feel like preaching this thing. It says, before I form you in the womb, I knew you, I knew you, I knew you. Now notice what he says, before I formed you. you can, notice what he says now, before I formed you. Watch this church, your parents made you, but God says, I formed you. They made you, but I, I formed you. I made you strong where you needed to be strong. I gave you personality where you needed personality. I gave you talent where you needed talent. And I put everything in you that needed to be in you for you to do what I built you for. I knew you before you were born. I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before I, before I formed you, I saw the prophet in you. You were a prophet, you missed it. You had a prophetic ministry before you had a body. And when the body got here, I saw the prophet. I never saw a baby, I always saw a prophet. And even when you went through your bad seasons, I always saw a prophet. Y'all not talking to me. I didn't see an addict, I saw a prophet. I didn't see a promiscuous man or a woman. I saw a prophet. Y'all aren't talking to me. I didn't see a thief and a swindler and a liar and a conniver. I saw a prophet. I didn't see an insecure, weak woman or man. I saw a prophet. And I don't know what you saw. I saw a prophet. And what you did didn't change what I saw. I still saw it. And at some point in your life, I came to introduce the old you to the you you were born to be. I came to reintroduce you to yourself. See, see, this is the trip. 
we're trying to teach people to discover who they are when God's trying to introduce them to who they were born to be. Because we think that just because who I am isn't dysfunctional, it's destiny. Let me say that again. We assume that just because who I am isn't dysfunctional, it must be my destiny. But just because it's not dysfunctional doesn't mean it's not destiny. I could have went in the law. That wouldn't have been dysfunctional, but it wouldn't have been destiny. Y'all aren't helping me because I was born, good God Almighty, to be standing right where I'm standing, doing what I was doing. We're trying... See, just because I'm not doing wrong don't mean I'm right. Let me. Did you hear what I just said over here? Just because I'm not doing wrong doesn't mean I'm right. God interrupt Jeremiah's life. Say, I don't know what you had planned, but let me tell you what you were born for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know what you want to do, but let me tell you what you were created for. Let me tell you what those gifts are for. Yet yeah, those gifts that you don't understand, those gifts that, that, that haven't been unearthed yet, let, 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 let me tell you what, you what you were born for. Now, now notice Jeremiah's response because it's so critical and key. His response, he says, alas, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. Here's the gap. God's saying, I see a prophet. Now watch this. Let me contemporize the text. Let's just say this. For, for, for all intents and purposes of my argument, he saved. He saved. He saved and still doesn't see himself right. He's, God says, what's up, prophet? He says, uh-uh. <laughs> Talking about a prophet, he says, wait a minute. God, you must, you must, you dialed the wrong number. Uh, I don't do that. Holy Ghost, come get somebody right now. I pray right now that you go up and down every row. I pray that you start pulling on stubborn hearts who don't want to hear what you're calling them to do. I pray that you would make the comfortable uncomfortable. I pray that you'd agitate those that are at ease in Zion and running from what you called them to do and who you called them to be. Jeremiah says, I don't do that. I got a background ministry. I don't speak. And you can't be calling me to do what I don't do. This is not an isolated incident. <laughs> this is all throughout scripture. Gideon can testify. Gideon was an Old Testament character who God called to lead Israel in a military expedition to overcome some enemies, the Midianites that were oppressing them. But Gideon did not start off as some military leader. Gideon was a man that was infected and full of fear. He was a fearful man. As a matter of fact, he was hiding, threshing wheat in a wine press when an angel walks up to him. Lord, I feel like preaching and says to him, you mighty man of valor. Now here he is, this will preach, doing the exact opposite of what God calls him. He's acting afraid, afraid and God calls him a man of a, a, a bravery. And Gideon says, no, you, you got the wrong one. That's not, that's not me. I, Lord, I got to go. Yeah, you, 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 got, you got the wrong one. This, 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 this can't be me. Come here, Moses. No, this, this, this can't be me. I don't, I, I don't speak. I told you I have a background ministry. There's a gap between how God sees them and how they see themselves. Somebody's lying. I want somebody to help me preach this. I said somebody is lying. Romans chapter 3 verse number 4 answers the question for us. 
Let God be true. I don't hear you, church. And every human being be a liar. Okay, somebody lying about your potential. Somebody's lying about your future. Somebody's lying about your calling. Somebody's lying about your joy. And it's not God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're trapped in a case of mistaken identity. And God sends the truth to set you free. Because you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Are y'all all right? Jeremiah said, I, mm -mm, I can't do this. Notice God's response to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I can't speak, and I'm just a youth. <laughs> and the Lord said to him, verse 7, do not say I am too young. Notice God did not deny his youthfulness. <laughs> he didn't deny. Jeremiah said, I'm young. God probably said, you're right. I'm ratchet. You right. <laughs> Come on and talk to me. Lord, I'm a trip. You right. Lord, I'll go off in a minute. You are right. Lord, I'm shy. You are right. But watch what he says. Don't speak it. Listen to what. Listen to what he says. Do not say I'm too young. He says you right, but don't say it. Don't keep talking about who you used to be because I'm not interrupting your life to remind you of who you used to be. I'm trying to change the conversation. I'm trying to introduce you to who you were born to be. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He says, <laughs> he says don't say I'm too young. D don't, don't say it. Reminding yourself of who you were has no redemptive value. He said, if talking about your youthfulness would help you, I'd let you talk about it. But because it's of no benefit, let's eliminate what you're trying to use as an excuse from the conversation. Let me park here for a minute. Because if I will let you use it, you'll use it. You will create a limitation where there, is, where there isn't one if I let you. Because this excuse would have been satisfactory for you. This excuse would have been enough for you not to become who I called you to become. But I'm not going to let you let something limit you that doesn't have to limit you. So stop telling me where you from. Stop telling me who wasn't there. Stop, stop telling me you don't have any support. Stop telling me they didn't love you right. Stop telling me y'all not talking to me. I don't mind you talking about it. I just don't like the way you talking about it. Because if you were talking about it to move forward, I'd let you talk about it. But you're talking about it to stay stuck. This isn't therapy. This is complacency. Hush! Don't speak the limitation. You are young. I got to go. You are young. <laughs> you, 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 you are young. He says, but stop saying it. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Now, I hope you're ready for verse 8 because verse 8 is a declaration after diagnosis. It's a declaration after God diagnoses something because verse 8 says, watch this, do not be afraid of them. Wait a minute. Jeremiah didn't say anything about being afraid. 
He just said, I'm young. But God makes a declaration after diagnosis. He says, you're saying you're young, but you're really scared. Let me go over here. Y'all not helping me preach. Yeah, you really, you're telling me where you're from, but you're really scared. And you're saying people not right, but you're really scared. And you're saying you don't have support, but you're really scared. So let me diagnose what's really going on with you and make a statement that speaks to the real issue, not the issue you're putting up in front of me. What you scared of for real? Why hadn't you gone back to school for real? Why hadn't you started for real? No, I know you're going to tell me you're too young or you're too old. But why aren't you doing it for real? See, because people let you get away with verse 7. God won't. God's going to give you a verse 8. You'll tell people, I'm too old. They're going to say, yeah, you're right. You'll say, I'm too young. They're going to say, yeah, you're right. But God says, no, mm -mm. we need to go to verse 8. Don't be afraid. Now let me tell you why you shouldn't be afraid. Because I am with you. All right, y'all missing it. So Jeremiah, you ain't prophesied yet. So you don't have enough confidence in your gift to take a step forward. So since you don't have enough confidence, borrow some of mine. I'm with you. Y'all missed it. He says, okay, you don't believe in you yet. Believe in me. Yeah, you don't believe you can do it yet, but just believe I can, so do it. Yeah, you don't believe you can start it, just believe I can start it, so do it. Yeah, you, you don't believe you can accomplish it yet, but you believe I can do anything, so do it. Because I'm with you, and I will rescue you. If you get in a jam, I'll rescue you. If you get in a bind, I'll rescue you, because that's what you're scared of. My time is up. <laughs> and what does Jeremiah do? He takes a step where most of us stay stuck. Somebody say, there's a gap between what I feel about me and what God feels about me. I want you to see this. Somebody say, there's a gap. Yeah, the, now, wherever there's a gap, if I'm going to get to the other side, there needs to be a bridge. Faith is the bridge. Lord, I got to go. Faith is the bridge that you walk on. Hey, to get from where you are to who you're supposed to be. Faith is the bridge. You walk on faith. You walk by faith. Not by sight. Y'all remember when Peter walked on water? He didn't walk on the water. He walked on the word, didn't he? He says, if it's you, bid me to come. Jesus said, come. He stepped. He didn't step until Jesus said, come. So he didn't walk on water. He walked on the word. <laughs> you got to catch it. Jeremiah believed what God said about him more than he believed his own behavior. I got to go, but your behavior is lying to you. Y'all missed it. God called a man a prophet who had never prophesied. So if he had just went on his behavior, he would have never crossed the bridge into prophetic ministry because you think God calls you what you are when you are it. But he calls you what you are when you aren't it. Because the only way that you can become it is if he calls you that. Y'all missed it. He, he, he looked at an unpredictable, unbridled, irresponsible Peter and said, you're a rock. There was nothing about him that was reliable and steady like a rock. But the only way the rock could come out is if Jesus called it out. Hey, glory to God. And there's some things in you that can't come out until Jesus calls it out. Did you hear what I said? and he's calling you out of where you are and into who you're supposed to be. He didn't know prophecy was in him until he believed it and then prophecy came. Mm -hmm. 
where is faith needed if you prophesy, then I call you a prophet? Jeremiah, you don't, the reason I got to talk to you about what I put in you before you were born is because you're going to think that because you hadn't used it, you don't have it. But there's something inside of you that you hadn't discovered yet that is beyond what you ask or think. Jeremiah, you got to catch this. Before I form you, notice the text, I knew you. You didn't know you. So we got to come out of arrogance now because you don't know you best. See, somebody needs to tell us that. You don't know you best. You didn't make you. You don't know what's in you. You don't know what's in you. I can't remember where we were. Ramon, I think I was with you. I don't know who I was with. I was with somebody. I, I think I was with you. And we were going somewhere. I don't know if I was, maybe I was speaking at, I think I was speaking at this, this conference. And we were riding to the conference, and he just said out of nowhere, man, you from Kilmichael, Mississippi. We not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be speaking here. We're not supposed to be doing this. You're from Kilmichael, Mississippi. You don't know what's in you. You don't know what's in you. I'm too old. Who told you that? I don't have a problem with the statement. I just want to know who told you that. Who told you I'm too old to do it? No problem with you saying it. I just want you to answer this question. Who told you that? Because if God didn't tell you that, that might not be true. A couple weeks ago, I put on a pair of pants I hadn't worn in some time, been a long time. And uh, I reached in my pocket and I felt some paper. And man, I pulled out, uh, it was like two $20 bills, $40. And some of y'all laughing, he's like, $40, see me? It could have been $2, it's more than what I had. <laughs> like $40, $40. <laughs> $40? And I used it. But I wouldn't have been able to use it if I didn't have it. And I wouldn't have it if I didn't, if I didn't reach for it. They've been there. I don't know how long it's been there. I had no idea. But when I reached for it, I found something that was of value to me. I found something that could be used that hadn't been used before, not because it wasn't there, but because I didn't know it. And this is what was crazy. The day that I found it was not the day it was put there. It had always been there. And then one day I found what I didn't know I had. You'd be amazed what you could touch if you would reach. You'd be amazed what can change if you would reach. And what God wants to do throughout this series is to push you to reach like you never reached before. I pray everything changes. I pray you pray like you're forgiven. I pray you pray like you're God's child. 
I pray you value yourself like God values you. I pray that you never settle another day in your life. I pray that you nego everything is changed. I negotiate like I'm God's child. Because when you don't know who you are, you'll negotiate from a place of weakness, not from a place of strength. And you'll sign what you don't have to sign. And you'll agree to what you don't have to agree to. You'll accept terms that you don't have to accept. But you, when you know that God is with you, that he is for you, it changes everything.